I, it's great that you could join us today, and it's my great privilege to introduce Elim's official historian on the release of the first of two volumes on Elim's history. And I'm delighted to join with Maldwin Jones now. Maldwin, you've been a Elim pastor for many years. Yep. You are well known in the movement and well loved and um, you have been a great blessing to many people's lives Thank watching you. today. And congratulations on the book coming out. Thank you. And they came to Elim. That's right. And this has been a work of love for you for some time. Yes, it has. Now. I know it's been a, a goal and intention as Elim's official historian, but you've got such a wealth of knowledge and information and research. And to see it coming together in a book is just something that we're all really excited about, looking Thank forward you. to turning those pages. So big congratulations to you. Uh, Malwin, before we look at the book, why don't you just maybe tell us something about your background and maybe some of your personal journey that has led you to this place yes. of releasing this book at this time? Certainly. Um, originally, I'm um, from North Wales. I was born in a little village called Dolredin, which is about two miles from the slate mining town of Blenifestinog. We moved down, the family moved down to the, the Ronda when I was seven years old. My father had died when I was only 14 months old. And so um, there was uh, six of us children at the time. Um, others had grown up, two had died. And um, we moved down with my mother to Porth in the Ronda Valley. And it was there in, um, in a church that's known to, to both of us and, and loved by both of us, Mark. Absolutely. That uh, through their witness and testimony, I came to know Christ as my saviour. The pastor of the church was William Evans. And he uh, took um, the young people down to a youth camp in Cornwall, in Porthpeen, uh, just outside St. Austell. And it was there at the age of almost 15 that I committed my life to Christ. I was appointed in 2014 as the official historian, and I succeeded my very, very good um, close friend and mentor, um, Des Cartwright, and Elim's official uh, archives bears his name. It's called the um, uh, the uh, Des Cartwright Desmond Cartwright um, archives. But I'm also a trustee of the Donald G Foundation, and recently the Donald G collection minus the Assemblies of God archive has been transferred um, from Mattersea to, um, uh, to Regents, our um, Bible college. I think the value of history is that it, um, it, it, it teaches us uh, both the positives and negatives. It gives us some idea of where we have come from. And I think without a knowledge of our structure and of our foundation, it would be very difficult to establish anything without having those foundational um, tenets um, yeah. uh, uh, present. So we, I know that to some history is a, is a dry old thing, to me, you know, I come alive when I talk about, uh, about history and, and I think we need to know the story of Elam. The, the, the story of Elam is really, truly and absolutely miraculous. And we see, Maldwin, we see this sense of knowing who we are. Yeah based on an understanding of where we've come from, present in society, don't we? We see TV programs, Who Do You Think You Are, where yes, people are right. looking through their family line to yep. try and understand something about their present. Yep. And you're saying that it's really important for people in Elim today 
to really understand something of the journey we've been on because it explains something about who we are today. And not only that, but, but it gives us um, an idea of what we were and if we managed to achieve what we did in those early days with, with, with virtually no advertising, or very little anyway, and with, with no um, uh, administrative, uh, a, a cohesive administrative foundation behind them. There was one year, for example, 1928, if I was to tell you that in that year alone, the Royal Albert Hall held uh, 17 Elim services. Wow. In one year. 17 in 1928. Amazing. And each time the place was filled to capacity. 10,000 people gathering each time. So in, a, in, in, in one year, you could say there were 170,000 people, Elim people, well, they, they, a lot of them would have been the same at each time, but I'm saying that on 17 occasions in 1928, the Royal Albert Hall had 10,000 Elim people worshipping in it. And at that time, the organisation was only 13 years old. It's incredible. So, Melvin, just from your answer there, and I know something of what I think you're going to say now, but Elim didn't start off as this small incremental sea that grew gradually over a period of time. There was, in those early days, some significant explosive growth oh, yes. that happened. Yes, without a shadow of a doubt. Um, um, it was it, the sort of growth that would be on the front page of Christian magazines oh, today, isn't absolutely, it? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, the Elin started in Northern Ireland and by, um, it started in 1915. Uh, the first four chapters of my book talk about the background uh, to, um, to Elim um, and the influences that, that, were, that were involved that fashioned George Jeffries. Um, but after speaking at the Sunderland conventions with Alexander at the invitation of Alexander Boddy. Um, uh, there was uh, a, an Irishman called William Gillespie who gave him three 10 shilling notes um, to go over and visit in Northern Ireland, which he did firstly in 1914, at, at Christmas uh, 1913, sorry, he went to the um, to a Pentecostal convention in uh, Independent Church in, in Belfast. And then they had a meeting in Monaghan. They were going to hire the um, Methodist Church in Monaghan, but that wasn't possible. So he came back over here. Then it, at Christmas 1914, he went back and he met up with a group of young men and they held a meeting in, um, in Knox's Temperance Hall in uh, Monaghan. And there were eight men that met together to, um, to discuss a, a, a means of reaching Ireland with the full gospel on Pentecostal lines. Now, the minute book of that is, is held in the GS's office in, uh, in Malvern, which I have had access to and seen, and seen myself. So they decided to start what they called an evangelistic band. 
and the first three members were George Jeffries, Ernest Darra, who became his right-hand man for many years, and a lady called Margaret Strait. And uh, she was straight in every <laughs> se sense of the word. She was a very strong lady that um, uh, didn't, uh, didn't beat about the bush. And if you, were, if you were wrong, she would tell you straight. She was that sort of, uh, of person. So they were the first three Elim evangelists. Uh, the first thing they did was that they, they hired a tent and then bought one for 25 pounds. And they held a campaign in Monaghan in August of that year. But they needed to buy a building that they could base their um, evangelistic activities from. And an old disused laundry came available um, in the west end of... Um, uh, at the Shankill Road end of, of Belfast. And they bought that and did it up and uh, they started holding meetings there and before long it was, it was filled. Uh, one of the things that they uh, said in their original, um, it was called Elim Christ Church and George Jeffries was appointed the pastor. And uh, they drew up a little booklet for uh, new members. I wouldn't call it a constitution, but it did say, one of the things that they said is that they would not encourage believers from other churches to join them. They wanted um, new converts. And George was determined to reach to the to reach out to the unsaved. So that was the start of Elim, and the little place became soon became crowded. That was 1915. Then in 1916, George held a campaign in Ballymena, some uh, a country town, some 30, 35 miles north of Belfast and uh, a, a very large and thriving assembly was established there. Within oh, weeks of it opening, it had a regular congregation in excess of 300. And from that center, a number of, of other churches were opened and the same in, in Belfast. A second church was opened in Belfast in 1919 in Melbourne Street. And then in 1926, a very large building was opened in Ravenhill Road um, to be called the Ulster Temple. And I had the joy of being the pastor of that church for three years. So um, that all that happened up until 1921, there were by that time 29 Elim works in various parts of Northern Ireland. Not all of them were churches, but there were certainly 29 centers from which the Pentecostal um, message was, was, um, was declared. And there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of innovation. You know, you mentioned about um, you know woman being in that first group of people in that evangelistic band. You know, at a time when there weren't many women in ministry, there was a, there was right. a lot of innovations um, around that time. And if you could if you could take a coach trip of people from Elim churches today and take them in this coach to go and experience the past. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that's probably what you've done with your book, really, isn't yes. it? You're yes, You're giving people a coach around, around some of these yep. incredible moments in our history. Yeah. Yep. Could you just maybe tease us a little bit? Because we don't want to give the whole book away. No. We want people to get the copy of the book and, to, yeah. and get them for all yeah. your church and all your family and friends. But 
what would be some of the things, what would be some of those high points that you would drive them around in the coach to experience? Well, I would, I would have to start with Ireland, because Northern Ireland, because that's where Elam started. And the first um, head offices we had was uh, in Belfast, in 3 University Avenue, Belfast. And uh, also the first evangel was the first evangel was actually published in Tamworth through a guy called F. B. Phillips, the brother of uh, my personal hero, um, uh, Ernest uh, John Phillips. Oh, so he did have a name as well. It wasn't just initials. Oh no, no? everybody. A lot of people went by by initials, but. Um, you wouldn't call him Ernest. <laughs> uh, you wouldn't even call him E.J. Um, everybody would have called him either pastor or sir. But uh, there you are. The other part is that I'd go to South Wales because alongside the happenings in Belfast, uh, there were stirrings in South Wales. Um, George had a brother called Stephen. Stephen was older than George by about some eight years. And he was very much a, a, a collier. He had worked underground, as, has, as had George Jeffries himself. When he left school, his job uh, was um, sitting entirely in the dark at the age of 12 about uh, um, seven, eight hundred feet up below ground, uh, sitting on a little stool, opening the doors for the horses and the uh, carts with coal to come through. And he would, he would just have um, uh, um, a candle because I don't think the Davy lamps, they may have just about come into into being at that time. He'd have had a little lamp and that's, that's what he'd have done from the age of 12. So, um, but uh, whilst George was, was pioneering in Ireland, Stephen was at work in South Wales and he was the minister of a church in Ireland Place. And in June 1914, I think it was, no, July 1914, whilst he was preaching, something quite extraordinary occurred. Uh, there came a, a sort of a facsimile of the face of, of Christ on the wall behind him as he was preaching. And the face changed into, in, into, into that of a lamb with, with, with blood on the lamb. And who could see this? The people in the congregation. So everyone was seeing the same thing? Everyone could see it. Stephen himself couldn't see it. But the commotion obviously made him look and... Um, that was, that, um, whatever some people would refer to it as an apparition or whatever, but it was on the wall for six hours. Wow. News of this um, got through the town and literally hundreds and hundreds of people came to see the 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 apparition of the bleeding lamb on the wall in, in, um, in Senesi. And um, uh, Stephen was convinced that that was, um, if you like, not a warning, but um, getting the people prepared for the coming of the First World War, which commenced later in August, the following month, I think. And uh, of course, there were far more people killed during the First World War than in the Second World War. And um, Stephen was convinced 
that that was um, showing the the um, the the sorrowful heart of our Savior towards what was about to happen in the world. Elim was birthed with many special signs and wonders. Yes, it was. That might have been a unique apparition, yep. on, an image on the wall, but there were many miraculous things would often get people's attention. Do you mention these in the book? Yes, I do. Um, there were some remarkable um, campaigns uh, where George would go into a town and he would start very small because people wouldn't know him. And then he'd hold an evangelistic meeting and he'd pray for people and somebody would get healed and the local press caught hold of it and before long, thousands of people came. And of course, you must remember this was before the days of the NHS where people had to pay for um, uh, uh, um, medical uh, for uh, medical health uh, services, and so for for um, for people to be healed uh, was something absolutely incredible, and there were some remarkable ones. I'll I'll, I'll give you two, one from Barking. In, in East London, and the other from Swansea. The situation in Barking, um, uh, Stephen Jeffries um, held the campaign in Barking. And in the early days, it, when we moved, when Elim came across the water to England, Stephen was the main evangelist and George was looked upon more as a pastor teacher. Um, and Stephen, or, or rather Edward, Stephen's son, tells the story that uh, they started in Barking Baths Hall, hall um, that seated about three, 4,000 people. And he said there were about 60 people in the afternoon all eyeing each other like suspicious sparrows, is how Edward recalls his father saying. In the evening, there were about 100 people there. And one guy who was well known throughout the area, um, a famous cripple called Tom English, he went in for prayer and uh, he, he, well, he, he had crutches, but, uh, you know, just, just really shuffled along. And he was due to go in to have a, um, an amputation in a couple of weeks after that. And he got instantly and miraculously healed. And he ran around the place like a lunatic and shouting to everybody, I've got it, I've got it, I've been healed. And the following night, the place was full. So from 100 to what, three, 4,000 people? To three or 4,000. Wow. And the Elim had already started in Clapham. But um, as a result of that, there were huge campaigns held in, in Leighton, in East Ham, in Canning Town, um, and, and the East End just, just opened miraculously for George. Um, two great crusades had been held the year previously in Grimsby and in Hull. Um, so that's, that's one notable um, healing. There was another uh, remarkable healing in, in Southampton Crusade too, where a lady called Florence Monday uh, was prayed for and she had um, a, 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 a condition where um, I think she had TB in the spine 
and had been bedridden for 15 years. And she was brought into the meeting in a bath chair and she walked home. Wow. But the, another, the, the, the one in Swansea that I was going to refer to was a, a fellow called Glyn Thomas. And he was a, a, a notable hunchback in Swansea and he, he sold the um, newspaper. And everybody knew Glyn. And uh, the meeting was held, uh, at, it may have been held in the, um, uh, in the big hall in Swansea, but it, the, the early meetings were held in the um, Methodist uh, Central Hall. But um, he went out for prayer and immediately he was prayed for. The hump literally disappeared and his coat hung like a rag on him because wow. the hump had gone and he stood up straight. And he later became um, a, 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 an Elim pastor and did stay with George when, the, uh, when there was a division in the movement. But um, uh, so those are two very, uh, well, three very remarkable testimonies. And it seemed to be a pattern, Maldwin, wherever these campaigns took place, yep. that there was something that it seemed like God would do a similar yep. thing place after place. And many Elim churches today are established in areas where many of those missions took place. Absolutely. And I think what is, what we, what's almost impossible for us to understand is how he took the biggest halls in the country, you know, um, um, Plymouth is an example. He started, there was already an Elim church that had had a very successful campaign held by Stephen Jeffries in October 1924. And then in January 1926, but this time Stephen had left Elim and joined the Assemblies of God. And George went to hold um, a couple of um, Bible teaching services in Plymouth. And he held it in, um, in Stonehouse Town Hall. And people were healed. So he was only going to be there three nights. He stayed in Plymouth for six weeks. <laughs> and by the second week, had moved into um, uh, Stonehouse Guildhall. Then he moved to um, Plymouth Guildhall. And after a further three weeks, he took over the drill hall in Plymouth, which was a military place and described as a field with a roof on it. And that seated 6,000. Wow. And it was filled and a very strong church was established in Plymouth. Um, so some of that's, that expression of we are partly because of our history and it helps define who we are. Many of our Elim churches across the country today have those origins. That's right. That's part of our heritage and part yep. of our beginnings. Um, this book, Maldwin, it's the first of two volumes. Yes, it is. And this takes us up to 1940, so just yep. prior to Second World War. Yes. Um, any particular reason why you chose that point as the finishing? Yes, this? because 1939 and 1940 were very difficult years for Elim. Uh, there was internal strife between uh, George and members of his 
Executive Council, we now call them National Leadership Team, uh, which meant that George um, left the movement that he had founded in 1940. And so I've taken the first volume up uh, to that time and I include details of the very sad uh, schism that occurred in Elim at that time. Was that hard to write? Because I can imagine writing about the miracles, about these yeah. large gatherings of people, it was a real joy to write. Was it really difficult writing about some of these sad things in our movement? Yes, it was. But, see, I believe the hand of God was upon our movement in its birth. It was on our movement in the time of crisis. Um, some people find it difficult that the leadership of the movement was for a number of years taken up by what some people saw as, um, as an administrator, whereas before they'd had an evangelist at the helm. But uh, there is a, a need for multi-talents and multi-gifts within the church. And I believe that E.J. Phillips' um, uh, uh, leadership and uh, ministry, though greatly unsung, uh, I believe that his ministry was absolutely crucial and essential for Elin, not only as a result of this split with George, but as a result of the devastation caused by the Second World War. And I think we could find ourselves in a similar situation after what has been a completely um, and, and totally different experience that anybody uh, of our lifetime has ever gone through the pandemic that, uh, that we are going through. And I believe that just as um, we had sound leadership to bring us out of the horrors, the double horrors of the split and the Second World War, I believe that Elim will not only survive um, uh, the pandemic, but will grow we had at one time 10 churches that had congregations in excess of a thousand people. But those services were held at night. Suddenly, the split occurred that caused not only some people to go and leave Elim to go with George, but who were so disillusioned by internal strife within the movement that they decided to leave Elim altogether. For example, Nottingham, there were something like about um, a dozen small assemblies of God that were started throughout Nottingham um, with a lot of people that had attended the Nottingham City Temple. Um, that had a Sunday evening congregation of 1,400. Uh, so the disillusionment of that saw us lose many people. But then also, during the war, there was blackout. So people weren't able to go out at night. And the evening meeting uh, was the main powerhouse if you like, it was the main, it was the shop window of Elim churches. And suddenly you had churches that had evening congregations in excess of a thousand suddenly stripped down to about 70, 80 people because their the men folk were gone. Um, in cities, the children were removed to various parts of the country. So you lost your uh, Sunday school, 
your youth activities. And it was sheer devastation. And it affected Elin more than any other denomination, I believe, because the ev evening evangelistic service mm. was the, the mainstay and the, the place of growth within the movement. And, and that, that just disappeared overnight. And so the changing of style of leadership, I don't know how much of that you cover in this first volume. I, I cover a little of it. I'll have more to say on that in the second volume. A real cliffhanger there for yes. us. Yeah. But it was, some people have maybe termed it as almost like a consolidation period. Is that how yes. you would say yes. it? Yes. Well, I would call it a rescue period. Um, uh, people were saying that um, Elim could not recover from the dual effects of the split and the war. Um, and, and so um, evangelism, which was the lifeblood of Elim, was almost sucked out of it in a very short period of time. But what did happen was that a number of the, of the um, churches uh, decided to reach out to the forces people. And I can tell you one very lovely little story of, um, of a lady, I think she was in our Carlisle church. And... Um, uh, sometime in the late 50s, a big Rolls Royce drew up outside her little house. And the owner of the Rolls Royce came in and introduced herself, himself to her and said, I will never forget your kindness to me when I was in the forces and how you had me round for tea, and how you made sure that I was looked after. He was, by that time, a giant in industry. And for about 10 years, every summer, that Rolls Royce uh, would pull up outside her little house and take her for a holiday in Scotland. Wow. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, Maldwin, this um, book, And They Came to Elim, um, maybe actually you could just explain where this foundation of the word Elim came from. Well, uh, there were two things. Um, when George Jeffries, George Jeffries in about 1913, was invited to preach at a little mission in Lytham St. Anne's, just outside Blackpool, and that was called Elim. And he was so impressed by, um, uh, by, and it was run by a lady, and he was so impressed by her ministry that he said, if I start anything, I will call it Elim. And, you know, coming from, from Wales, the two of us, we know that... Um, uh, the chapels in Wales always were given names. Yeah. Even if they belonged to a denomination, they were, they were never called um, Methodist Church Porth. There was a name, and always a biblical name, Calvaria and um, Horeb, Moriah, Carmel. Um, Bethesda, Bethania, these are all names of chapels in Wales. So it was a, a given, if you like, that a, a chapel or a church had to have a biblical name. And so George said that if he started anything, he would call it Elim. And the name Elim is taken is found in the book of Exodus. Exodus. Um, I'm trying to think. It's chapter 15, verse 
27, and it says, and they came to Elim, where they went, and, and I'm quoting it in the authorised, because that's how I learned it. Uh, you're not reading this, so I'm going to impress um, you quoting it, so uh, well done. And they came to Elim, where there were 12 wells of water, and three score and ten palm trees, and they encamped thereby. Maldwin, it's going to be released soon, yes. but people can get their copies directly from you before they can get them anywhere else. Yes, they can. As long as they beat the rush, that is. Yeah. So get in there quickly. <laughs> That's How right. do they do that? Well, they can do it to uh, a number of ways. Um, uh, they, can, they can do it through two emails. The one email is... And it's all one word. And we'll get this on the screen yeah. as well. Starting with a capital A. And they came to Elim um, at yahoo.com. If they can't get through on that, if they... Um, if the uh, queue is so yeah, big... They, to can, get the they can message me on Messenger, uh, on Facebook. Price of the book is 12 99 and um, the P and P is uh, three pounds twenty. So it's um, what did we say, Ruth? Three um, uh, sixteen pounds twenty nine pence. Now we're now we're hearing the voice of the person that is really the genius behind this book. <laughs> yes, Mrs. Mrs. Jones in the room, Ruth. So yeah, get the get these copies and order some for your teams and your churches. I know we're getting them for the team here. And Maldwin, if there was one hope, I'm sure there are a number of hopes you have for this book. But if there was one thing you wanted to happen in the life of the reader at the end of concluding this first volume up to the 1940s, yeah. what would that one hope be? It would be to understand that the gospel of Christ is from beginning to end miraculous and supernatural. We are empowered by the Holy Spirit. And um, the, the, we, we talk about the baptism of the, of the Holy Spirit and the purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is to make us fruitful in and zealous in evangelism and i to me the most important thing is for us to realize that jesus christ rose from the dead on the third day he's alive today and he commissioned his disciples uh, to proclaim the gospel to heal the sick and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We are commissioned. I'm sure all those watching would like me to convey, Maldwin, our thanks and our gratitude for the work that you've put into this. This has been a labor of love for you. You have visited this history in a way with fascination and wide eyes that enable those of us who may find he reading history a little bit tougher, you have done so in a way that brings it to us with a freshness and a life. And we will always be grateful to you for thank doing that. Thank you. So on behalf of everybody, thank you, Maldwin, for thank writing you. this and blessing this.